Well, uh, it's uh, two o'clock, so let's uh, start uh, this webinar. I would like to welcome all of you who are attending the, the webinar on ocean oxygen, the role of the ocean in the oxygen we breathe and the threat of deoxygenation. I am uh, Gilles Le Ricolet, the president chair of the European Mine Board, and I'm your host uh, for this webinar today. So let's uh, run through housekeeping rules. The, um, the housekeeping is the, the, the following. So please make sure your name is clearly entered. So when you ask question, we know who you are, of course. If you want to ask question during the discussion, use the Q&A button of the Zoom. Let us know which organization you are belong to and your country that we, we know who you are. Um, then the discussion moderator will select the question to be addressed to the panelists. If you have, if you encountered any Zoom technical support, use the chat button. And uh, just to let you know that the webinar is recorded and it will be made available on uh, the, the website of the European Mind Board. You have the address on the slide. And also on the European Mind Board YouTube uh, channel. Okay. Um, just to, to say that I forgot to tell you that if you want to tweet about this event, you can do so. You will see that there is a, on the bottom uh, of the slide, of this slide too, uh, there is the EMB Twitter handle. So you can use it if you want to tweet about this this um, this meeting and uh, you have here the agenda. Uh, so we will start by uh, uh, a presentation of the document and its recommendations. Will we be given by the working group chair, Marie-Laure Grégoire and Andreas Oschlis. And uh, then we will uh, continue to the response to the document uh, by the European Commission. And uh, I thank Laurent Markovic from the DG Environment to, to do so, and then we will continue by a panel discussion and a question and answer uh, from the audience. This will be moderated by uh, our uh, EMB Executive Director, uh, Madame Sheila Mainz. And uh, during this uh, panel discussion, we will uh, have a discussion on importance of considering the ocean deoxygenation in science and policy. And we will uh, have a discussion on how best to communicate about the oxygenation and the role of the ocean in the oxygen we breathe. Then we'll have the, the, closing, the closing words. So if we, if we uh, talked about the, 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 the webinar today, it's a, a webinar dedicated to a, a future science brief which was uh, launched last Thursday, last Thursday, sorry, about some of the very strong French accent I have. Uh, that was uh, during the World Ocean Day. And it was uh, during the Association for the Science of Limnology and Oceanography, ASLO 2023 conference. And uh, the document is called Ocean, Ocean Oxygen and uh, the role of the oxygen and the oxygen we breathe and the threat of the oxygenation, strangely the same name as the, the webinar today. The document is can can free from our website. You will get on the on the on the slide. Uh, again, I will say it's an important topic to address as we all know that oxygen is a central element of life, even if it represents less than one fifth of the volume of Earth's atmosphere today. This gas, oxygen, uh, we all need to breathe, was not always present in the atmosphere, although oxygen was always there. And as I'm a geologist, I have to say that it was always there in compounds in the interior of the Earth. It has been a long Earth history before this gas appears in the ocean and accumulate, accumulate in the atmosphere. Um, every one of us knows this sentence. Not every second breath you take, the, you know the sentence 
from the song from the album Synchronicity of the of the band uh, Police, who was released in 1993. Seriously, the sentence is every second breath you take comes from the ocean, highlighting the importance of ocean oxygen. However, we will learn, I think today, and it's in the in the report, that despite the widespread use of this sentence, it is not always phrased correctly, and we will learn that today, I believe so. We can also say that the awareness about the threat of the global oxygen loss in the ocean, termed deoxygenation, is low, particularly in comparison with other important stressors, such as ocean acidification or increasing seawater temperature. So, to produce such a future science brief, if we go to the next slide, uh, we we had a, this uh, future science brief. We um, uh, highlight the causes, the impacts, and the mitigation strategy to tackle ocean deoxygenation. The European Mine Board engage a working group composed of twelve members from ten different countries that ran during a year from June 2022 to June 2023. And we were happy to have also three external reviewers who provided a very vi valuable input. On, uh, on this slide, you, you can uh, uh, see information about the working group that produced this document. It, this working group was selected to ensure diversity in geographic, location and background to be able to address these diverse needs. And we are very grateful to the members uh, and, and the external reviewers. Uh, they were under the leadership of the chair and co-chair. We will hear them today. And we would like to thank them, all of them, for all their work and pro in producing this valuable publication. Some of the working group members are present on the webinar, and they will participate to the discussion in the discussion day. Uh, okay, now it's really time to hear about our uh, chair and co-chair. So um, the, the 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 chair is uh, Marilo Grégoire. Uh, she is uh, based at the University of Liège in in Belgium. I think Liège, maybe without the the Belgium accent, is is the best pronunciation I will have today. And uh, we have uh, as co-chair Andreas Oschlis from uh, Geoma, which is based in Germany. So for me, I think it's uh, time to leave the screen to Marilo, and uh, I let Marilo give a presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Marilo, the floor yes, is yours. Thank you very much, Gilles. I'm starting to share the screen, so it's coming. Uh, mm -hmm. Oops. No. Okay. Yeah. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. It's perfect now. You yeah. Full screen. Full screen. Yeah, full screen. It's okay. Okay. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Gilles. So thank you, Gilles, for this uh, very nice introduction. And uh, good afternoon to everyone here, or good morning, wherever you are. So I am Marie Laure Grégoire and Miss Andrea Sochlis. Uh, uh, we will present you uh, the main outcome of this future science brief number 10 of the European Marine Board on ocean oxygen. So as mentioned by, by Jill, it was really a team effort. And you can see here on the, all the members of the groups. And uh, we really thank all these team members. Uh, so the contribution were very, very essential to the release of this document. We also would like to thank the European Marine Board for the very efficient support for the production of this oxygen brief. And so uh, today uh, we have the pleasure uh, with Andreas to show you what is inside this document. So I will start the presentation and then afterwards I will give the floor to Andreas who will continue. 
So um, starting, uh, I, what do we will what will we talk about today? We'll first make an introduction. So in this document, what will you find? You will first find an, in, uh, an introduction that describes how the oxygen uh, and also about ocean deoxygenation. Why is it important to understand what what's happening? Then. Uh, to explain that, we would like to go back in the past and uh, uh, to the to several billion of years ago, and we will uh, describe. We are describing the history of oxygen on Earth, so in the ocean, but also in the atmosphere, and its relationship to the lives, to biodiversity, and also to massive extinction events. Then we move to um, the shorter time scale, if I may say, so the modern oxygen cycle. And then we describe the oxygen in the atmosphere and in the ocean and the coupling between the two. After we move to the current ocean deoxygenation, what's happening and what's the impact on marine life and biodiversity, biogeochemistry, ecosystem services. Then we move to uh, the study of ocean oxygen using observation and models. And then uh, we propose some mitigation and adaptation action uh, to tackle the deoxygenation issue. And finally, we conclude with a very important recommendation for policy management and research. And if you go into this document, you will see that it's written to be understandable for a wide audience. So we hope that the scientists will find some new information, but it's also a targeting for to policymakers and research funders. Okay, so the starting point of this uh, brief is really this sentence that Jill mentioned previously, every second breath we take comes from the ocean. You probably have heard many times this sentence or variants of this sentence, and there are some debate in the scientific community about the correctness of this sentence. And so uh, one of the objectives of this document is uh, to explain the sentence and to explain when it's correct and when it's not correct. So uh, first is the public awareness. What the public awareness about ocean oxygen? We think that the general public knows that the ocean is producing oxygen. Everyone knows that. But uh, what the people do not know is how far the ocean is important for the building of the oxygen of the oxygen in the atmosphere. So the oxygen that the humans are breathing. On the other hand, there is still a low awareness on the problem of ocean deoxygenation compared, for instance, to ocean warming and ocean acidification. So the objective of this document is really to raise public awareness, both on the uh, correct role of the ocean in building the oxygen that we are breathing, but also on ocean deoxygenation. So the history of oxygen on Earth, if you look at this figure here on the left, you can see here a relative level of oxygen that is present in the atmosphere, uh, or that was present in the atmosphere relative to the current content that we have today. And you see this content across the different geological eons. Okay? You see, if you look at this picture, that most of the time, during most of the life of the Earth's history, sorry, we do not have a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. We do not have oxygen in the atmosphere. And then we had two important events that are really tipping points for the building of oxygen in the atmosphere and in the ocean. These two tipping points are first the great oxygenation events that you can see here, okay, that happens more or less 2.4 billion of years ago, and which is related to the emergence of oxygen producing cyanobacteria that have evolved and that have built, that have uh, produced oxygen in the ocean. First, this oxygen uh, was consumed by oxidation reaction, and then afterwards it accumulated in the surface of the ocean and then move to the atmosphere. There is a second tipping point, which is the Paleozoic oxygenation event, which also caused a drastic change in the oxygen content in the atmosphere, and which is due to the evolution of land plants in the Earth. 
And you see that in parallel to this increase of the oxygen level, you also have an evolution of the biodiversity uh, uh, in the ocean and also in the earth in general. You see this evolution, but you also see here that there was also, in parallel to this evolution of biodiversity, there was some massive extinction events, mainly five events. And among these five events, we uh, three of them are correlated to deoxygenation in the ocean. So this really stressed the point that we have to take care about ocean deoxygenation, because in the past, this ocean deoxygenation were associated to massive extinction events. Hopefully, uh, at longer time, at very long time scale, there are a lot of numerous feedbacks that stabilize the oxygen level in the atmosphere. So, and now if we look at the geological, uh, at the oxygen cycle at very long time scale, we mean geological time scale, we can, we have this picture. So the at geological time scale, the process that will build, that will increase the oxygen in the atmosphere is really the imbalance between photosynthesis and respiration. This imbalance is due to the burial of organic matter in the sediments and here on the land. And we know that this burial of organic material is much more important in the ocean compared to the land. On the, in addition, in the ocean, we have the burial of pyrite, which is uh, quite important and which make that in the total, the ocean has contributed to 86% of the oxygen that the humans breathe which means six breaths over seven come from the ocean over geological time scale. So it means that it's much more than one over two, it's six over seven if you look at the oxygen cycle at very long time scale. So if we move now to the modern oxygen cycle, here you see what we call the biological uh, oxygen cycle. It means the oxygen cycle at shorter time scale. At shorter time scale, we can consider that we have more or less balance uh, between photosynthesis and respiration. And we can also consider that the photosynthesis in the ocean and in the land are equivalent, which means that at biological time scale, we can consider that 50% in the ocean is in the ocean and 50% of the oxygen is produced on the land. So that's uh, that, that's the difference between the biological oxygen cycle and the geological oxygen cycle. And so now, if we come to, the, uh, to our sentence, uh, every second breath that human takes from, come from the ocean, is it exactly uh, what is happening? No, in fact, it's a little bit more complicated. To have accumulation of oxygen in the atmosphere, you need to look at very long time scale. These long time scale are the geological time scale. And if you look at the geological time scale, uh, the, uh, the building of oxygen in the atmosphere is mainly due uh, to the ocean, to the ocean burial of organic material and of pirates. And more precisely, we can say that six breaths over seven come from the ocean. If we now look at the oxygen cycle at shorter time scale, at biological time scale, then we can consider that we have an equivalent amount of oxygen that is produced by the, uh, by the ocean and by the time scale. The ocean produces 50% of the Earth's oxygen. So, uh, and then uh, how is, is this, this oxygen distributed? The distribution of oxygen in the atmosphere and in the ocean is quite different. In the atmosphere, the oxygen is distributed very homogeneously. In the ocean, we have very big difference. We have very, very big gradients over the horizontal and over the vertical. Over the horizontal, you can see them here. You see that we have region in the ocean which are called oxygen deficient zone, which means region where the level of oxygen is so low that it will impact the biodiversity and the biogeochemistry. These regions are, uh, are represented here by the blue dots that you can see in the open ocean. 
and by the red dots that you can see in the coastal ocean. In addition to this important gradient in horizontal, we also have very big gradient over the vertical. And these gradients are due to uh, physical processes and different level of ventilation and also biological processes because we have a decoupling between photosynthesis and respiration at the, at, at, under the surface. And so since 1950, we have evidence that the ocean is using oxygen. So in the open ocean, the causes of this deoxygenation is mainly due to the human-induced climate change. What, why is it due to the human-induced climate change? Because as the ocean is warming, you have a reduced solubility of the oxygen in the ocean. So you have a low flux from the atmosphere to the ocean. And on the top of that, you have reduced ventilation and you also have reduced mixing. And all these three processes make that the open ocean is losing oxygen since uh, the middle of the last century. It's between 0.5 to 2% of the oxygen content of the global ocean that is lost. In the coastal ocean, we also have a reduction of the oxygen level, but here it's uh, mainly due to eutrophication, which means the discharge of nutrients and of organic material from the continents to the ocean. And this huge discharge creates region of low oxygen uh, condition along the bottom of uh, the coastal zone. On the top of this eutrophication, we also have, of course, the climate change that will intensify this uh, production of oxygen deficient zone. And so now I move the, the, the uh, I give the word to Andreas to continue the presentation. So Andreas, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, my lord. So ocean deoxygenation, that's the process occurring, going on right now. Since at least the middle of the last century, the ocean has lost uh, about 2% of the oxygen inventory. That doesn't sound like a large number, but it's, it's a very rapid decrease. So if we would continue this for two and a half thousand years at this rate, there wouldn't be any oxygen left in the ocean. What are the consequences of this right now and possibly in the future? First, we have uh, biogeochemical consequences. These are that uh, aerobic respiration is, once oxygen runs out, replaced by other processes that consume nitrogen, consume other electronic sectors. And this has major impacts on nutrient inventories of the ocean. So we have altered biogeochemical cycles. We can lose fixed nitrate, fixed nitrogen in the ocean, the main fertilizer. Uh, we can also produce potent greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide and methane. These are produced in low oxygen environments upon uh, respiration of organic matter sinking into these low oxygen waters. And uh, in some areas, we also see that there are positive feedbacks. First, because of these greenhouse gases that lead to additional warming, and additional warming leads to more stratification, reduced ocean ventilation, and increased deoxygenation. The second positive feedback is that uh, low oxygen also increases the flux or the release of phosphate from sediments. So there can be some ocean interior fertilization, eutrophication from remnants from phosphates in the sediments when these turn anoxic. Two positive feedbacks we can envisage. Um, then we have direct impacts on marine life. So, of course, habitat loss. If you can't breathe, nothing else matters. The slogan of the Canadian Lung Association also applies to fish and to many higher uh, species in, in the ocean. So they either have to move away if they can. We, we see species distribution shifts. Also at higher oxygen levels, if you st still can breathe, but in the survival in the ocean is a very high energy demand sport or activity. And whenever oxygen levels drop, there's less energy available for escape or uh, behavior. And this will also lead to species shifts, composition shifts at higher oxygen levels. And at least, uh, at last, uh, acute or chronic low oxygen levels can result in mass mortalities, as you see on the picture on the top right here. And as you have seen in my last part, to mass extinction events even. So there is concern that the oxygenation has direct impacts on marine life. 
It also has impacts on humans, particularly living close to the coast and depending on marine ecosystem services. So we have kind of degraded water quality, food supply, and economic resources. Yes, it's uh, yeah, relevant for many coastal and even growing but portion of the world population. Next slide, please. Marilor, can you move to the next slide? Yes, I try. <laughs> do anything. Um, well, we have, uh, how do we study this? Uh, or this? Well, we are scientists, so we have to understand, to measure first what, what is going on, what is the current state, what is changing, and we need uh, observations. And these depend on sensors. We can't look deeply in the, into the ocean by remote sensing. So it's, we have to go into the ocean, measure in the water. And this requires sensors, autonomous platforms that are now more and more developed that can survey a much larger part of the ocean than we can do with uh, the few research vessels we have. So this allows for continuous measurements and uh, basically uh, increased spatial and temporal coverage oxygen samples per year for the world ocean. That's not a lot if you consider that 70% of the planet is covered by ocean. And uh, measurements are particularly challenging in low oxygen environments because of the high precision we need there. And many instruments, such as those you see on the right, they contain oxygen. There's some bubbles can be included and they can uh, affect measurements. So we have to be very careful, and this is still instrumental development is necessary. Better sensors are needed, particularly to measure low oxygen environments. And we also have the past records. These are all the records of the sea sediments of the seafloor, and these can be studied to infer what has happened in the past, what was the uh, temporal resolution of different events or processes leading to low oxygen environments and to impacts on biology. Still, again, there, the data situation is uh, not very good. We have limited uh, information of limited regions in the ocean that we need this global coverage, particularly in low oxygen environments. Next slide, please. To make sense of isolated observations, isolated in space and in time, we can use and we do use models. They can coherently interpolate information gathered from these isolated measurements. And they can also be used to uh, make uh, to, to simulate scenarios, what if scenarios. So what happens under different climate warming scenarios, what happens under different policy scenarios. And this is uh, something we, we use models for. Global models, that's for the uh, Earth system. And there we still see it is challenging to correctly model particularly low oxygen environments again, and to model the change of these environments. So global models so far, all these models that we know uh, for, from IPCC report, reports, underestimate the rate the true ocean is losing oxygen. The underestimate is critical, it's a factor two to three. And so we really have to improve our current models it can use oxygen as a very good indicator of changes, rapid changes in the ocean that we have uh, observations for and that we can challenge our models and calibrate current models. So here's an added value of oxygen observations to improve climate models. Coastal models are particularly important for decision makers, for society. What if scenarios, what happens if we have better management of wastewater, of nutrient fertilizer runoff and so on? And these are needed to inform about cost-efficient measures that can help us to reduce the deoxygenation or reduce the impact of deoxygenation. Uh, the next, and yeah, all these models, of course, need calibration. So we, there we need all these data, uh, oxygen data as well, as well as other data, temperature, salinity, carbon, nutrients to constrain these models and make sure they are as good as they need to be to inform society in a useful manner. Next slide, please. What can we do in terms of mitigation? And if mitigation is not possible, adaptation. First, limiting global warming is key. So uh, from current models, we know that uh, once we stop uh, um, global warming, we at least stop. So we need to reach uh, net zero hydrogenic greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as possible. And oxygen deoxygenation is another uh, lever that we have to use to 
uh, call for action in terms of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Coastal deoxygenation is also affected by runoff of nutrients, as Marie Law explained earlier. So here we have a direct control. We can limit terrestrial runoff of nutrients and also of organic waste. So that's uh, management options that are in many countries already well underway, not everywhere, and we can certainly globally improve this quite a bit. And then we have the third management option here, blue carbon ecosystems, so coastal ecosystems that do photosynthesis, and they reduce oxygen as a waste product. These are uh, seagrass meadows, um, salt marshes, mangroves, particularly. And they can help to oxygenate local environments and coastal waters. So there's a well co-benefit of reoxygenation in some areas, but also of uh, habitat uh, improvement, biodiversity protection, coastal protection in some cases, uh, and also many positive uh, impacts on human activities like tourism. Next slide, please. There are also some ideas uh, to, to go into technology and to use technology to reoxygenate a part of the ocean. There have been uh, some, some first field trials um, some successful, some not at all successful. So this is some activity, um, there are some first proposals. We have to study that very carefully to see what are the true benefits, what are the side effects. Is this really beneficial? Who decides what is beneficial? And we need excellent scientific knowledge to carefully manage this and also govern this. Like one example is the hydrogen economy. Hydrogen by electrolysis also produces oxygen as a waste product, which so far is mostly vented into the atmosphere, but some companies now have ideas to use it uh, to, for the oxygenation mitigation. There is scientific knowledge needed, and uh, well, we are prepared and we see some responsibility that the best scientific advice is to be given here before things can go wrong. The deep ocean, where we also see deox uh, deoxygenation, and where we know or think from models at least that this will continue for several centuries, even if we stop global warming today, that's a major concern. And there's no really good mitigation idea available for the deep ocean, which might be very vulnerable because it has been stable or might have been stable for a long time. And so we here have to really ensure that we first observe what is there, that we increase our knowledge about the deep ocean, but also that we reduce all stressors to the deep ocean. That includes deep sea mining, but also many other activities, since there will be stressors, or the main stressor might be deoxygenation of the deep ocean for centuries to come. This is already change in the pipeline produced by anthropogenic activities that have already occurred in the past. Next slide, please. So our recommendations from uh, this study, we, well, first for to policy makers, management and society. So all of you listening to this webinar today, we have to recognize the ocean deoxygenation is a major threat to the ocean, to marine ecosystem, and thereby to a large part of our planet. Uh, we have to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions to stop global warming and thereby stop ocean deoxygenation. We have to limit runoff of nutrients and organic waste. Organic waste, uh, and, and, and also that includes um, also atmospheric deposition of nitrous oxides. So, so many air pollution aspects also lead to fertilization. So this is essential, we can control this. And this is, uh, well, the, way, the only way to go. Then we have to reduce other stressors to protect marine ecosystems to be more resilient, particularly the deep sea ecosystems. Uh, we have to include uh, oxygen in all future projects like IPCC, IPBAS, because it is like warming, acidification, sea level rise, a main threat, a main stressor to our systems, to the ocean system. And we have to promote the following statements. Uh, the ocean produces 50% of Earth's oxygen every single second. Every second breath taken by all life on Earth comes from the ocean. That includes the marine life. And since the origin of life on Earth, the ocean has provided most of the oxygen in the atmosphere. In fact, six out of seven parts of the atmosphere, and there are six out of seven breaths we all take. Next slide. 
And so the final recommendations, these are now for funders, but I'm glad to, to uh, that we have the next speaker from the year coming here as well, for research and monitoring. So we need funding to perform better research to understand the observation history, current and future, possible future uh, scenarios. We need funding to perform research to understand the impacts that's bi on biology, chemistry, and have better process understanding, which we can then feed into the models that to do uh, process uh, scenario simulations. That's, that requires third point here, more observations and better observations combined with modeling efforts. And we have to ensure all oxygen data is really compiled and shared openly. Many oxygen data today are not publicly available. They belong to coastal states because they are good indicators of pollution. They are often not shared, not made widely available. And we have an effort by the Global Ocean Oxygen Decade Program, a UN Decade Program, the Global Ocean Oxygen Database and Atlas, GLODA, which combines, aims to combine all these data, make them openly available into some Atlas product to share and to make all the best information available to the society. This also includes more measurements, includes better and low cost sensors that can be applied worldwide in an easy way. And we also have to look at other stresses, acidification, warming, since there's uh, might be uh, synergies, but, but that might be uh, mutual uh, relations between these stresses and their impacts on the ecosystem. To better understand, second to last point, how deoxygenation will impact marine life from individuals to populations to ecosystems. And finally, we have to fund and perform research to understand the vulnerability of our ecosystem services the ocean provides to our society and our economy and their sensitivity to the oxygen. So the blue economy will depend on oxygen in the ocean. And that's what large parts of the world population will depend on. And we have to make sure that we transport this knowledge into action together with the communities. And that's the best win-win situations where we can have this bi-directional chain exchange from information, of information from scientists and the stakeholders used to coastal oceans, to ecosystems, and their use and the impact, direct impact of deoxygenation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, both of you. Marie-Laure and Andreas was very accurate, interesting, and uh, giving recommendation and the important recommendation uh, for funders especially and I uh, think also for policy makers and I think we we need we need that in, in that direction and uh, I will take the this opportunity to leave the floor or the screen to Laurent Markovic which uh, who sorry who is a policy of sorry Laurent who is a policy officer at the DG environment from the European Commission and he's belong, he belongs to Unit C2, which is marine environment and water industry. And uh, uh, Laurent, we uh, wait for, for your response about these documents. And uh, if you have any recommendation or others, you're welcome. So the screen and the floor is yours, Laurent. Thank you very much, Gilles, and I would uh, like to thank the European Maritime uh, Marine Board for giving us the opportunity to uh, to give to share of our uh, impressions on your recommendation. Uh, just a, a small correction: the new name of the unit is now now Clean Water Services and not uh, Water Industry. So, yeah, it's it's about we we have two parts in the unit: one dealing with the marine environment, the other one with uh, water. So, um, indeed, there's a clear a link to what you're doing also on, on this report. Thank you for the brief, a very interesting presentations from uh, Marie-Laure and, uh, and Andreas. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm replacing today Sylvia Bart Bartolini, my head of unit. She couldn't be with you and, and she's sorry about this, but she asked me to, to present her impressions on, on the report. Um, briefly on the unit, uh, on the marine team, we're doing, we're, we're following the marine strategy framework directive. So we have, 11 descriptors uh, describing the state of the marine environment, and I will link that with your report, of course. We also the the nature restoration law, uh, the marine part of that, which is uh, discussed 
now at political level, and also the new marine uh, action plan. So it's trying to put together and better implement the uh, the environmental uh, law under the EU and also the, the fisheries, fisheries law. And as you know, fisheries has a high impact uh, sometimes on, on, on the seabed and therefore also on, on carbon capture, which is linked to uh, climate change, which is linked also to deoxygenation. Um, for us, uh, in, in our unit, in, in the Commission in general, it, it's very clear that we have a nexus between uh, fre fresh water, the, uh, the, the marine environment, climate change, that was explained, I think, by the, the two uh, presenters before me. And um, I would like to underline that oxygen uh, deoxygenation is not one of the 11 descriptors of our directive, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, uh, but we have one descriptor dealing with eutrophication. And as Marilor explained, that there's a very clear link in coastal waters between eutrophication and um, deoxygenation of, uh, of the ocean. And a clear and sad example of this, of course, is the Baltic Sea in the EU, where, um, that, where there are so many dead zones where marine life is, is, is not possible anymore and, and clearly has an impact also on human activities, for instance, fisheries. Um, so, um, uh, as, as I mentioned, we are mainly working on the marine, marine strategy framework directive, and especially eutrophication, which is pertinent for oxygen, uh, uh, ocean deoxygenation. And uh, from our perspective, addressing uh, this impact of uh, eutrophication will uh, help also address ocean, ocean deoxygenation. Uh, I would also like to inform you that the uh, MSFD, so Marine Strategy Framework Directive, is now under review. Uh, for the review, so there will be a new proposal and a new law, if you wish, in, in a couple of years, uh, still being discussed. But our intention is to strengthen the link between oceans and climate policy. And of course, as mentioned before the, by uh, Marie-Laure, I believe, uh, there are also a clear link between climate change and deoxygenation because uh, a warmer water uh, doesn't hold as much uh, oxygen as a, uh, as a cooler water. So now to come to your recommendations and, and I, I react briefly on those and link it also with the EU policy. Uh, the first recommendation was about reco recognizing deoxygenation as a threat uh, to the marine ecosystem. And as I said before, for us, it's, it's a very clear link and there, there's no question about that. We clearly acknowledge uh, in the Commission this link between climate and ocean and also ocean being a carbon sink, but also a heat sink, obviously. And, uh, and that's exactly the purpose of the MSFD to address uh, the, the, the pressures on the ocean, at least in the EU waters, because this is what we're doing. Uh, to come to a, a more healthy, productive, and resilient uh, marine uh, ecosystem in the EU waters, because uh, a resilient uh, marine ecosystem is 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 more uh, resistant to climate change, and therefore um, helps prevent ocean uh, deoxygenation. Now, your second recommendation is about reaching a net zero uh, human emission. Uh, you're probably aware of the uh, strategy, uh, the EU, EU Green Deal, which is really the flagship of the Commission for, for the, the, the mandate of uh, President von der Leyen. And basically, the objective of, of the EU Green Deal is to uh, come to a fully sustainable uh, growth strategy for the EU with net zero emission by 2050. So uh, in that case, the EU would be the first, uh, the first continent to be a zero, net zero emitter. And we have, of course, uh, uh, an interim target for 2030, where we want to decrease uh, the um, emission of CO2 equivalent by 55%. Of course, it's a big challenge. It has a lot of ramification, not only about industry, but also cars, planes, um, heating, you name it, a lot of challenges to tackle, obviously. Um, now, if we're talking about climate change and ocean, ocean deoxygenation, it's, it's not only a matter for the EU to treat, obviously, that's a global problem. Therefore, it calls for global, uh, global treatment and global uh, tackling of this problem. Uh, and the EU is very ambitious in the context of uh, the UNFCCC, so the, the, let's say the, the Paris Agreement. And as you know, uh, the discussions are ongoing in Bonn now to prepare the, uh, the, the COP28 in, uh, in, in November, I believe. So be rest assured that the EU is very ambitious. First, we want to promote, of course, our uh, EU Green Deal. 
And second, everybody is aware, not only in the about limiting runoff of nutrients and organic waste, and, and there again, the EU is active in this context, uh, not only through the water framework directive, uh, the nitrous directive, which aims really at decreasing the, the influx of nitrous into, into the sea, the common agricultural policy, and this is no mystery, and that was shown by Marie-Laure in one of the maps, that we have not reached uh, the objectives. We're not fully where we want to be. I mean, she clearly, clearly showed on the map that the EU water, in the EU waters, uh, there were um, areas where ox oxygen was lower than what we want, basically. So this is why uh, under the, the Green Deal, um, the, the commission uh, published and adopted a new strategy, which is called the Zero Pollution Action Plan. And the aim of this action plan is by 2030 to reduce uh, the uh, nutrient influx into the water, into fresh water, and therefore in, of, in the ocean by 50%. There again, very ambitious uh, target, but this is uh, really something we, we need to tackle uh, urgently. Uh, as regards the MSFD, we also have actions as regards uh, nutrients. I mentioned this before. One of our um, uh, descriptor is uh, eutrophication. And there, uh, the member states, uh, the EU member states program of measures. So they announce what they will do to tackle the issue and reach a better state uh, for eutrophication. And therefore, the, the programs of measures are essential. So I would really encourage each of you in your in your respective member states or your countries to, to liaise with your ministries, the, 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 the competent authorities to underline this point. Oxygen, uh, ocean deoxygenation is also about nutrient management. That's a clear thing. So we all need to push in the same direction and actually pull in the right direction. And finally, for as regards uh, nutrients and organic waste, um, the, uh, the so-called farm, farm to fork and biodiversity strategy, which are two other facet, facets of the EU Green Deal, announced uh, two years ago the, the, uh, a new initiative, which is called Integrated Nutrients, Nutrients Management Action Plan. So that will encapsulate all the areas, uh, all the legislation, if you wish, that aim at reducing nutrients and flux into the water and put it in a co coherent way and in an action plan that to reach the objectives of reducing uh, this influx uh, by 50% in 2030. Now to come to your two or three last recommendations, um, you recommend to managers to promote resilience of marine life by reducing stresses and including, in, increasing protection. Uh, this is also something the, uh, the EU is tackling. For instance, under the MSFT, as I mentioned before, uh, with the, the, the member states, uh, the EU member states just agreed on so-called threshold values. So basically they agreed that a certain fraction of uh, the seabed, which is a big carbon storage uh, uh, compartment, uh, needs to be, uh, let's say, preserved from human impact. So that's brand new and that would be put in place and, and implemented very soon. Uh, other than that, of course, uh, the EU is active uh, and, and, and also, of course, will implement the recent decision on the uh, on the BBNJ, BBNJ that was agreed a couple of months ago. So that's biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, because we're not only active in the EU waters, but also at the international level, of course. Uh, I would also like to let you know that in the fisheries context, uh, the so-called deep sea access regime, which is a regulation protecting, protecting deep sea fish stocks, uh, the, the Commission just decided last year, uh, in September, I believe, to close 87 uh, deep sea waters um, uh, areas, which are partic particularly important for, um, for biodiversity of these uh, fragile deep sea ecosystems. And I believe this responds in part to your, um, to your concerns and to your recommendation. And under the Marine Action Plan, we also uh, ask the member states and, and encourage the member states to, to close all their marine protected areas designated under the Natural 2000 network, to close them to bottom fisheries. As mentioned before, bottom fisheries uh, more than often has a uh, disturbing role, a uh, disturbing effect on the uh, seabed and therefore on carbon storage as well, which is linked to climate change, which is linked also to oxygen, uh, ocean de deoxygenation. 
And for the last recommendation, you, you recommend to increase so societal awareness on this subject. And I would like to inform you that the, uh, the, all the data under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, so all the, the data and uh, analysis that were uh, put together, for instance, by the European uh, Environment Engine Agency are uh, publicly available on a couple of websites, which are, which are maintained by the, uh, by the Commission. One of them is Ymarine, and the other one is Emodnet, where you have more scientific data. Ymarine is more for the public to, to see what's happening and to take stock of the situation. MODNET is more about scientific data put together for the benefit of researchers. And finally, uh, to react uh, to a couple of uh, statements by the by Andres and Marie Laure. First, um, I was I was fully aware of this say uh, of this motto. Let's say uh, one uh, breath out of two comes from the ocean. But now I I think I will modify it. I will say uh, seven out of eight uh, breaths you take come come from the ocean over the long term. And uh, as as concerned Andres presentation, um, you mentioned modeling for future prospects to to understand better uh, what's going on and to to plan and, and management in in. in areas particularly sensitive to ocean deoxygenation and I'm pretty certain you're working together with the uh, Joint Research Center of the Commission uh, because I'm aware that they have a modeling team working on nutrients and uh, modeling of nutrients uh, runoff and the influence of that in, in the ocean. And with that, I would like to thank you all and uh, wish you a very good meeting and if you have a question or to now, I can take them, but I'm afraid that, that then I will have, have to leave around uh, at three o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Laurent, for uh, this uh, on, uh, on site and uh, important remarks. I'm very happy to, to, to ask the geologists to hear that we, we need to, uh, to know the past if we want to understand the future. And uh, we see that it's, it's important, so uh, it's not the only important point, but it's the one I I take with me because of the as a geologist. So now we, we have uh, we still have some time so for for question and discussions. Uh, so if you have a, if question, uh, you can leave a comment and uh, list, please ask and comment using the Q and A function. I see that we have already five. Five Q and A, five questions or five remarks in the Q and A. So I, we will uh, see that uh, on on, on uh, after. So to answer and comment the questions, we have five panelists. You can see them on on uh, on the screen. Uh, I invite them to turn on the the camera. So I would like to welcome. So we see we have a specialist from overseas, uh, Denise Denise Breitberg from the Seismonian. Smithsonian, sorry, Environmental Research Center in the USA. I don't have the same uh, accent as you, so I'm sorry about that. You will pronounce it better than I do. She's a senior scientist and an expert in ocean deoxygenation, which is what we need today. And we have Jan, Jan Seis uh, from the Flanders Marine Institute in Belgium, and he is the head of the communication department and in, an expert in marine science communication. And we have seen that we need uh, communication and we have a uh, working group uh, members. Uh, so uh, Donald uh, Carfield from the University of Southern Denmark, who is an expert in the history of Earth oxygenation and uh, together with Marie, Marie Lo. Uh, Grégoire and uh, Andreas Oxis was the chair and the co-chair of this uh, of this paper. So um, um, now I have to to stop speaking because we're running a, a little bit of time and I hand you over the discussion moderator, which is uh, Sheila Imans, our unbelievable and uh, important executive director, who helped to with the secretariat to make this European Mind Board be uh, what it is now. So thank you very much. And I'll leave you to Sheila to moderate the discussion. And I shut my mouth. Moderating so far. And hi, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Uh, hello, everybody that's online as well. Um, so I think um, it might be good if we if we have some questions for Denise and Jan first, because and, and Donald, 
um, before we, we go back to you guys, Andreas and, and Marilor, and maybe some of the questions that came uh, through the Q&A. And also, if other people have questions on the Q&A, please, please continue to, to give them. And I'll start with Denise. Um, Denise, I, I guess you've been working on deoxygenation for a long time. So um, I guess my, my first question to you is, why should we, we be worried about it? Um, what do you think are the consequences that it could that they could be for for humans and society by the end of the century? Thank you, Sheila, and and thank you so much for including me in this important event. Um, what's interesting about that question is, to some extent, I feel like if this was happening on land, we may not even be asking why this is important. Um, deoxygenation really is the transformation of a rich rich vibrant ecosystems to to wastelands to the equivalent of poorly managed agricultural areas where it's still producing protein but um little else um or to deserts where the vast majority of animals are excluded except for a few specialized species that can tolerate harsh environments um but uh, you know, if we look more specifically um, at the effects, oxygen really affects everything. It affects, uh, as as Andreas outlined earlier, uh, behavior, survival, uh, growth of animals, uh, chronic exposure uh, uh, acts as an endocrine disruptor and interferes with reproduction and um, it creates habitat loss. Uh, where species that are important to economies and societies can be excluded uh, and, and, and things like jellyfish may thrive. Um, and it also is important in the way it interacts with other uh, human distressors to the oceans. When animals avoid low oxygen, um, they may become more susceptible to overfishing. When oxygen is low, they can't tolerate increasing temperatures uh, in the oceans. Um, and sometimes it's just, uh, I'm not sure if this is just an American expression or, or not, it can be the straw that breaks the camel's back where just one more thing going on is enough to cause severe damage. Um, and so by the end of the century, um, as Andreas pointed out, uh, especially in the deep sea, we know that th this problem is going to continue, um, and there are predictions of potential very large-scale extinction events, um, and even before that, uh, real strong effects on fisheries that can affect human health, uh, human, human welfare, and, and livelihoods. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Denise. Um, and then Jan, uh, Jan says, uh, it's, um, it's nice to see you. We're probably in the same room, in the same building at least. Um, my question for you is, I mean, we heard about the, the, the issues with deoxygenation. Obviously, it's not news to, to either of us. But um, as a communications expert, how do we communicate this best so that we don't undermine the severity of the problem without just always being doom and gloom? What is the best way to do that? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Sheila. Yes, it's a, it's always the delicate balance, of course. Eh? And uh, uh, I think we, we always need two things when we talk about content that has something to do with science. First of all, of course, we need the proper science, the facts, the figures. That's and the, the truly ones so we don't have to uh, play down, hide facts. Not at all. We should bring the truth. But if you only bring the inconvenient truth, and often it's inconvenient, you create a problem. And what I see, I give quite a lot of lectures among the public, and today so many people are really desperate. They see so many disasters, catastrophes around them. They open the news, they see all kinds of things that go wrong, and it, it leads to despair and lack of activity. So that's the last thing we need. We need hope. We need some kind of optim optimistic, but and how to do that is quite clear. If you give first the inconvenient truth, please always try to let that follow by some kind of hope, some kind of solution, 
maybe some inspiring uh, stories you have, some inspiring examples. And that's the only way uh, you can compare it with. Uh, imagine that you are with a, a group of children uh, in the middle of a dark forest at night and you tell them a very horror-like story. And then after you finish your story, you run away and you leave them there alone. No, of course not. I think it's our responsibility as scientists also at least to be there to help them to co-design, to think about solutions. Of course, we do not have to solve the problems. Other people can do that, but we can help. And at least also we should do what people think we should do. They trust us. Most uh, well, people from the public, they trust scientists. And they also expect us at least to help them creating some hope. And that's what I really think we should do. And yeah, of course, the solutions are there. Also, if we talk about the oxygenation, I will not uh, repeat them. They have been mentioned before. Uh, they are there. So, and yes, try to keep uh, tapping on the same nail. There's nothing wrong about keeping uh, tapping the same story, making sure that maybe it will take a while, but uh, it's it's crucial. It's very important. Yeah, I think it's always true that um if more people say the same thing in different ways, then maybe eventually somebody will, will will speak the right language, use the right words to actually make an impact. So talking about climate change and the impact of that in all different forms is, is an easy way to, to and explaining why it's important for the oxygenation is quite important. And then Don, a question for you. Um, you're obviously the expert on the history, historical side, and it, it was great to, to uh, read your work. Uh, in this document, but uh, a follow up from the the discussions about the mass ext extinctions that um, that that Marie Laura explained as well. Uh, what do you think is the likelihood that the current oxygen deoxygenation trend could result in a mass extinction? Not well, that's an interesting question. Oh, sorry, sorry Sheila. Not, notwithstanding the fact that we don't always want to be negative. <laughs> well, that, yeah, I was just thinking about that, <laughs> but uh, I'll try not to be too negative. So. I think that that there are lessons we can take actually from um, from mass extinctions in the past. And if I could start, I'd like to to maybe highlight the end Permian extinction, where mass extinction was extraordinary. About ninety five percent of the marine animal species went extinct in the oceans during a relatively short period of time. And what scientists believe is that this was coupled to ocean deoxygenation partly, and that was related to a decrease in habitat. In fact, oxygenation was extreme at that point where the whole bottom of the ocean probably went anoxic. But, but, but there were multiple stressors. It was also coupled to a change in the, in the, in, in, in the temperature of, of the earth, so, so temperature of the atmosphere. And as it turns out, organisms that are sensitive to oxygen become even more sensitive to oxygen as temperature increases. So if you have two of two two factors operating sort of simultaneously, then the 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 the, the stress on the ecosystems, the stress on organisms, become even greater. And I'm afraid that's what we have happening today. It's not just a reduction in the oxygen content of the oceans that's happening, but it's also in light of a change in the in the temperature of of, of the oceans. So. In many ways, we 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 have we have a situation which is which is somewhat parallel to, to what has happened in, during previous mass extinctions. Now, I don't, I'm not going to argue that that that, that a, 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 an upcoming mass extinction will be as extreme as is what we what what we saw in, in in the end Permian. Not at all. But I will say that ecosystems are being stressed by multiple stressors, and that we really need to worry about that. And, and of course, coming back to the science, you know, one of the things that would be critical is to understand how organisms actually respond to these multiple stressors, especially especially large organisms, fish, that we care about. Thanks. Thanks, Donald. And actually, that comes back to one of the questions that was asked, one of the first questions that came in earlier on uh, from Edgar uh, Vervines, um from Venezuela. Hi, uh, Edgar. He's saying, uh, yeah, he's saying, what are the ideal organisms to estimate the effects of ocean acidification and the fall of oxygen concentration in the sea? Um, and what are the responses more sensitive to this, uh, to, to, to do this estimation? I don't know. It's not really neither Andreas nor Marilor is probably the right person to answer that question. Uh, I don't know if somebody from the working group uh, who is also there would like to answer. I think, um, yeah, I'll leave you to <laughs> 
I could try. I mean, I, I, I'm not I'm not quite the expert here, but I think that the, the, the organisms to look for are those that you would expect to be most sensitive. And and those would probably be more of the, the larger fish, more apex species. And, and, you know, monitor them, monitor their progress, monitor their migrations as 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 both oxygen and, and temperature, uh, temperature increases and oxygen decrease. And it's not just deoxygenation in the low oxygen parts of the ocean that are important. It's also deoxygenation in the upper parts of the ocean, just due to the increase in temperature itself. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so, so I, I, I keep my eye on those. Yeah. Denise, it looks like you have an answer there. Yeah. I just wanted to add one, one thing. Um, I, I absolutely agree um, with what Don has said, but the other thing that we're finding is that uh, animals that are, uh, somewhat tolerant of low oxygen so that they don't avoid it can sometimes uh, experience the most uh, severe effects on, on them that we see at the population level. So fish that will hang around the edges of low oxygen zones and have chronic exposure can have real reductions in population over time, um, increased disease, reduced reproduction, uh, things like that. So, so we're likely to see effects both on the extremely sensitive species and also uh, on some of the less sensitive ones as well. Yep. Thanks. Um, and then uh, I might go to another question from the from the Q and A uh, from Utam Kumar. He's asking. Sorry, I'm not sure if it's him or her. Um, have there been any measures? taken to confront the dead zones in the Baltic Sea, uh, which can be examples for other seas around the world. Um, I have an opinion, but I'll hear it. I'll, I'll hear it. The, the, um, Andreas, yeah? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm aware of at least uh, three attempts in the Baltic Sea, so basically field experiments to enhance oxygen levels in deep anoxic areas of the Baltic. One has worked and uh, is, uh, there's a few publications by pumping up, pumping down the surface of the elevated uh, at depth and uh, deoxygenation or anoxic environments could be made oxid, oxic, at least during the time water was pumped. So this was a successful, if you call, uh, like to call it, uh, measure. But the same approach failed in two other areas of the Baltic Sea because the water that was pumped down, surface water, oxygen-rich surface water was warmer than the deep waters. So the elevated temperatures on the sea floor enhanced respiration, microbial activity, which in the end consumed more oxygen than initially was pumped down. So there it was a runaway for the deoxygenation, oxygen loss. So exactly the opposite of what was intended. And that again tells us how difficult it is to to uh, to, to well, mess around with nature. Uh, most technological solutions try to address one aspect, but we always have to understand the entire system and the full response. And uh, we have to study that carefully before we engage into large scale operations. I think there are some ways that could work, but, uh, but we have to manage it very carefully. We need good governance and, uh, and uh, stop mechanisms as well. Transparency, full uh, public uh, consent, of course, and uh, and transparency to to all decision makers and governing bodies. Yeah, and um, actually, I, I I think the 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 second part of the question is: Is there anything there that can be used in other parts of the world? And I think the problem with that is that the Baltic is actually quite a small body of water compared to anywhere else. It's the oxygen belt, maybe not the chest, but you know, most of the other bodies of water that, that is having this problem is much bigger. And so you need a much bigger solution. And I will add that uh, the, the JRC work that Laurent was mentioning, actually the modeling work that they're doing, um, which looked at nutrient runoff. So, I mean, the, the, pro the, the way to resolve that problem is actually to stop the nutrients running into the Baltic Sea. And uh, they looked at what is actually being proposed by the, um, by, by, by law at the moment for reductions in nutrients and in all the European seas. And the only place where it made a smidgen of a difference was the Baltic in, uh, in, the, in the ecosystem of the, of the ocean, of the, of the sea. Um, you know, it makes big differences in the local area, but if you're looking at the whole Baltic, it, it made a bit of a difference there positively, 
but in all the other ecosystems, what, what is proposed at the moment um, through law for nutrient reductions isn't going to help, uh, just, just, just so you know. <laughs> Uh, so it's not going to work. Um, we have to do more. And uh, yeah, I guess the reduction in greenhouse gases is probably the thing that we have. That it's the lever, the only lever we have. We might have to push, and um, reducing multiple pressure. pressure. Um, okay. Uh, then there's quite a lot of other questions that I. Uh, another question here from Francois Lalier. Hi, Francois. It's nice to see you, or not to see you. And, uh, he's saying you're stressing the need to increase our knowledge on how populations and ecosystems react ad and adapt to deoxygenation. But do you think it should also comprise studies at the organismal level, um, spe specifically uh, in animals where the acid-base balance is strongly linked to respiration? Again, that's probably a question for Denise, probably, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, we definitely do need um, more uh, understanding of, of that. And I think that uh, when we're talking about animals that have strong uh, regulation of acid-base balance, the, the questioner may have been speaking about uh, fish. Um, but we need a real mechanistic understanding, uh, especially when we have a combination of oxygen and other stressors in order to wisely manage the resources. Uh, we need to be able to distinguish oxygen and, and other climate change stressors from effects of overfishing, for example, uh, in order to, to manage the resources, in order to understand um, what the causes are of the changes that we're seeing. Um, then, then there is a, a question by a anonymous attendee, um, which is um, maybe a question that everybody can think about here. Um, if we're really a, already aware of the problem of deoxygenation, um, and we know that it's a continuing issue, would it not be better to put more resources, in, resources into action? So funding restoration of blue carbon habitats, reducing emissions, societal changes such as circular economy, I guess they mean rather than research. I, I, I will see if Andrea or Marilo want to answer that one. Again, I have an opinion. Marilo or Andreas? Uh, Andreas, do I, I can start? So I, I, I think, and then you will continue. I think that you we, we need to, to support both. So knowledge, as Andreas has explained, solution, and then the solution creates a much more problem and even accelerate the problem. So knowledge is still, is still needed. Uh, there is not a solution that will work everywhere. And so knowledge on the system functioning is very much needed first. So we have really to work in collaboration with the solution from knowledge to solution, uh, which is really the spirit of the UN decade. So, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, I also think that uh, the sharing of data, because I see that there is a question on the data sharing, is also extremely essential. Uh, and uh, it's due to the sharing of data that we realize how uh, worldwide was the deoxygenation issue, because we have this map uh, from uh, that I show you with these red dots. And uh, uh, this show that this uh, deoxygenation is not a local problem, but it's really a worldwide problem. And this, uh, this is for, for having a, a, an accurate assessment and an up-to-date assessment, we really need to have this sharing of data and to encourage the sharing of data. And so that's uh, my word about the knowledge, understanding, and of course, for that, we also need models and then solution. And then I will give the word to, to Andreas, maybe if you want to add something on that. Yes, so so while the global solution is clear, we we have to stop emissions today and uh, nation right away. But uh, society hasn't done that for decades, and we are now maybe on a little bit better way than we were a few years or decades ago. But still, it's it's a very very slow process, and we will continue to emit greenhouse gases for for a few decades at least. That is associated with continuing deoxygenation. We can't. Right now, we don't understand where it will hit. We also have not a continuous development. We have heat waves. We have waves of anoxia going through the ocean. 
and uh, so all these mortality events are can can be triggered by very short just a few hours of low oxygen is, is enough to kill ecosystems and we we start seeing that on coral reefs and very shallow waters now so I, I, there is and we, we really need to to understand that and maybe there are adaptation or mitigation measures just to help systems survive for a few hours to if there's a heat wave if there's oxygen consumption at night when there's no photosynthesis so so there's a chance that we can do more in addition to removing emissions, which we have to do in, in, in addition to removing pollution. But maybe there are some well, last minute emergency measures that at least help to, uh, to, to well, bridge the difficult period that we are now entering. Thanks, and Jan, I see you have to, you want to respond as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I would like to add something because we need a science that's quite clear. We need action that's also clear. But before you can have real wide action, you need to put it on the agenda. And I still feel like it's not enough on the agenda yet. And when I look back at marine litter, I mean marine science for quite a while already. And I was running on beaches 30, 40 years ago when there was already a lot of litter. But nobody was talking about that. So it took until one sailor went through the great garbage patch and came back with a story like there was a massive amount of plastic, although it was like five kilograms per square kilometer, which is not all that big. But that story alone helped us to put us on the agenda. So maybe we should think about having one sailor somewhere go through one of the ocean deficient zones, do measurements and put it in the media. Because people simply do not realize that there are big patches of ocean that are almost uh, oxygen uh, deficient or without any oxygen. Everybody will understand that an ocean without oxygen is a big problem. We need to put it even more on the agenda than today. And of course, this is a very good step, this uh, future science brief and the work we do it. Yeah, and, and I think it, in addition um, to that, I think there's, there's always stories of uh, fish kills, uh, there's a there's a story just in the U.S. this week, this week in Texas. I think there's big fish kills. Um, certainly in Southern Africa, where I'm from, there's often fish kills due to deoxygenation. So those are very local, locally very uh, people people understand it, but it doesn't it doesn't have that big um, impact and and maybe realize that um, that might be the problem. Uh, then I think Don, there was a question that I thought that that you might want to ask one of the first ones that's up there anymore. Uh, what's the difference between oxygen produced by trees and by the ocean? Um, and I, I think it kind of is related to a question um, that, that we had on our list of questions to discuss, how stable are, are the oxygen concentrations in the atmosphere versus in the ocean? It's nominally related. Um, and you know, what, can we, yeah, what can we infer from the history of the ocean uh, the oxy oxygen and the severity of the current oxygen trend. So if you, I don't know if you want to answer the, the tree versus ocean question first. Well, I think that one's quite straightforward because it's about half and half. Is <laughs> I mean, the primary production in the oceans is about the same as the primary production on land. So the overall production rate of oxygen is about the same. I think that's a very interesting question about the stability of, of, of the two of the two environments. So the oxygen concentrations in the atmosphere are rather stable. They're stable on time scales of, 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 of millions of years. And that's due to the, to the slow geological processing of oxygen and then also the massive reservoir of well-mixed oxygen in the atmosphere. So, so atmospheric oxygen is relatively stable over long periods, but that's not true in the oceans because ocean oxygenation is impacted by, by, by temperature, by ocean circulation, by internal primary production, by a whole bunch of factors that can actually change on relatively short time scales. So, so ocean oxygen levels are much more dynamic than they are in the atmosphere on time scales, which are, which are very much, much human time scales. And I don't know, Andreas might wish, we wish to add a little bit more to that. I could imagine that, that, that he would, but, 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 but vastly different, I would say. Andreas? Yes, so, so in the ocean, most of the oxygen is produced by unicellular plankton, in which most of this already is respired within days. So it's very, uh, very, very fast cycle. 
we don't there's no trees uh, in the ocean there's uh, which which really can stand there for for centuries or millennia even and store the carbon and thereby leave the oxygen in the atmosphere or somewhere before it's respired again before the tree is decomposed again so that makes the ocean much faster much more sensitive to to changes in the environment but also more responsive to, to uh, any action that we impose. Thanks. Well, there's quite a lot of more questions that I, I'm not sure that we'll be able to answer them all. So I'm not sure. There's a question from Eric Mahu, which is quite complex for Andreas and Marilor. I will read it. And Andreas, if you will answer that. Yes. Sorry, I just wanted to, to the tree example. The, oh, yes. the environment is different as well. The tree is in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is well mixed, uh, so we don't have any gradients. It, it just mixes within uh, about a few weeks. The ocean is very, very slow, very sluggish. It mixes on this time scale of thousands of years. And so that's, uh, well, hundreds to a few thousand years. So that, that makes it, again, difficult to, to transport oxygen to depleted areas back whereas the atmosphere is much better connected the ocean is uh, is more and more difficult there are some isolated environments like these uh, shadow or dead zones in the ocean sorry yeah thanks um okay so I, I don't know if you saw the question it's quite involved and it's really about the carbon footprint of the lab that he's in so eric mahu is saying um, that we need to think about our greenhouse gas emissions and that they calculated their carbon footprint uh, to be, you know, more than what the IPCC is basically proposing, essentially. Um, and 60% from that comes from work um, at sea, but uh, yeah, but, but it could also be uh, more. So what's your position on that? So what a good question. If you, I don't know if Marilu Somebody has an answer on that. So just a, an, an answer, I'm not a specialist of that, but what I, I would say is that since the COVID, we, we are doing a lot of meeting online and I really I realize that a lot of people are really hesitating now for traveling for short, uh, for short, uh, for short meeting, for instance. You, you really not have the people for two days meeting. The people prefer to do it online. So which is better because you avoid traveling and it's it has been intensified due to the COVID, which uh, would help to reduce uh, our CO2 emissions. But then, of course, then when we have a longer meeting, it's still very important to have the in-person contact. So we mean at least five days or something like that. But uh, yeah, so that's, um, of course, with this meeting, we are still uh, producing uh, CO2, but uh, yeah. Much later, yeah. But we 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 try we we really we are really thinking twice before before traveling now because the this online meeting make it so easy but everything cannot be done online that's my message yeah Andreas yes we we have done a, a similar exercise in our lab and and it's it's very and I do it in my private life for years the carbon footprint of the year. It's, it's very frustrating, it's very difficult, and there's little we can do as individuals, I think, in terms of directly reducing emissions. We can particularly travel less, and even switching to renewable energy in the end doesn't save the climate because we, we do not, we just redistribute who uses which, the cleaner, the dirty power, and so on. What I think what's the most important part is, is vote. We need uh, policymakers, we need governments to do this, and we need the European Union and other uh, agencies really to uh, basically follow what the voters do. And if the voters want to protect the climate and to protect, keep ocean uh, oxygenated, I think then uh, we, we know how to do this. We know how to produce renewable energy. We know most things, uh, how to, to avoid emissions. That's 90%. And we also know or have good ideas how to remove the residual emissions, but also why well, we depend, depend on society. What do we count as residual? What is necessary? What, uh, what is, can be avoided? But 90% at least can be avoided and the rest we have to take care of. And we can use, again, blue uh, carbon ecosystem, marine ecosystems, the ocean can help us. And in the end, it will help. If we can wait 100,000 years, the ocean will take care of this. If we want to have it faster, we have to be uh, better prepared and uh, get our act together and 
vote the right parties and the right politicians to, to move this. Thanks. Um, I see that we're actually at the end of our time here, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't know if um, Jan or Denise or Donald want to add something uh, at the last minute. Sorry, Jill, uh, if you have any last words. Uh, for those of you that have more questions that we haven't answered, uh, we will keep them and we will uh, answer answer you in, in email later. So uh, you answer, your questions will be answered later. Uh, Denise, any last words? Just again to thank you and thank everybody who worked on this document. It's really important and I hope that through uh, exercises like this, we can get the word out um, a little bit more uh, about the importance of, of the ocean uh, and of uh, this uh, stress or deoxygenation. Thank you. Thanks. And, and Donald? Just real quick, I noticed a, a, a comment by Placido Benzai, which we didn't we didn't address, and he says these are difficult concepts. The some of the things that we're, we're we're talking about here, and I and I kind of agree with him. So so that's something we could think about. Hopefully, the document that we that, that we've produced will help. But um, did you do we have time for just a little a little anecdote? The, one minute. Yeah, go for it. Joel, okay, Joel so likes anecdotes. So, so we're thinking about this in a local context, and 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 we're trying to come up with some kind of a of, of something that 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 that, 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 that they can help people to take grasp. So, I'm working with some filmmakers from from Leisure. It's a little island in Denmark, and, and what really grabs these guys is the fact that you cannot get fish fricadella from locally caught fish anymore, and 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 that's partly because of deoxygenation of the sea bottom in, in, in the Kattegat. So something which everybody can relate to, that's fish fricadella in Denmark. And the idea that there's something in the environment, environmental change that impacts the ability of us to be able to enjoy what we've been able to enjoy for centuries. So so, so maybe something like that <laughs> could, be a way, could be a way forward. I don't know. There's my minute. Excellent. And Jan, sorry, if you have another question or if you have another comment there. Well, I just want to add to what Donald said. This is extremely important. So this is probably the first time that uh, well, a statement, which is not purely scientific, leads to a scientific publication. So this is great. And let's keep that critical attitude as scientists. This is extremely important. But let's not forget to bring that story in a way that is consumable for the wider public. And that's about emotions, that's about good storytelling, that's about good visuals, and that's about the kind of anecdotes that uh, Donald is uh, sharing with us, so. Thank you, thank you very much. And sorry, Jill, I, I went over my time there. Yeah, thank you very much to all of you. You let me only two minutes to, to, to conclude, which even less, but it was, uh, it was very nice and important, so. In, in my in my remark, uh, you know, I am provocative and I, I, I like to play on words and I, I like an anecdote, as you say. But uh, we, we have been talking about this uh, massive extinction, five or maybe over five. And I think uh, in any case, after the massive extinction, the nature are replaced with a, a new stuff. And, and, and for instance, with the mammifers at one moment, it's the reason we are here. And, and probably the nature is considering that they have enough of uh, human, human being on her. So I think that will be the end, the massive extinction and the end due to the Anthropocene and uh, why not? So uh, when you see what the man is able to do, especially at the moment with all these conflicts, and I would I'd like to recall always the SDG 16 that uh, we have to reach in 2030. Uh, we talk a lot about SDG 14, uh, SDG 13, climate change, but SDG 16 is peace and justice in the world. So I think we have a lot of difficulty and we will have a lot of difficulty to reach that. So probably without oxygen, uh, that will probably help the Earth to rebuild something a little bit better than we are, we are doing. Sorry about that, but... Uh, uh, I think we have heard a lot of interesting points and I um, thank you and thank you to the panel for that. And that's bring a sense of urgency. And uh, I think uh, we hope with that we will help to improve the uh, ocean health. Uh, 
uh, that's a positive word after what I've said, and uh, that's uh, reflected in the UN decade of the ocean science for sustainable development. And uh, I like to, to also emphasize the European mission, restore our ocean and waters. And uh, tackling the loss of oxygen in the ocean is critical, as you have mentioned, as you have really demonstrated. And uh, we need to achieve the aims of these uh, two initiatives in bringing also that point of uh, the problem of deoxygenation in the context uh, of what you have been presenting. So I encourage all the attendees to download the, and read the, the document and especially share it. I hope that the message and recommendation uh, will be taken up and used as a guide for the direction the sectors needs to travel in. Uh, so if you want to hear more about our activity, the activity of the European Mind Board, you have here uh, uh, the way you can connect uh, so to the Marine Board, and uh, uh, with that, uh, I think we arrived to that. You have a lot of other publications. We have in the important, also important in the same direction. And I would like to thank you again. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to the attendees. And uh, it's a uh, 3 p.m. 30 and one minutes, 15.31. And I think I can say goodbye and hand the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>